So what I'll uh, describe today are uh, the works I did in uh, Rami's lab in regard to uh, um, dendritic calcium spiking and synaptic inputs uh, into Purkinje neurons in the uh, cerebellum. And I joined uh, Rami's lab in uh, 92 as a second year uh, medical student. And back then when we started, there was um, very little information about the electrophysiology in the mammalian brain uh, at pressure. And uh, actually, Rami decided that the cerebellum may be a very important uh, model to work on. Uh, and one of the reasons is the, uh, the very organized architecture in which, uh, of the cerebellar cortex, in which the Purkinje cell layer is in the middle portion of this uh, cortex. And you can easily see it, even with the low magnification uh, binocular that we had uh, to view our slice inside the pressure chamber. There is the uh, molecular layer in which the dendritic tree of these uh, cells uh, project. And uh, there are two main, uh, the, the cells themselves are in the slice, are sponta spontaneously active with both uh, <coughs> sodium dependent somatic spikes and calcium dependent uh, dendritic spikes. So we could f follow spontaneous activity of single neurons and uh, actually follow them uh, to high pressure. And the other thing is there are two uh, very distinct synaptic inputs. One of them is the climbing fiber coming from the, through the white matter from the inferior olive. And uh, each one of them is uh, uh, connect, uh, make a lot of connections with the mid portion of the dendritic tree of the Purkinje cells. Whereas the parallel fibers coming from the granular cells in the granular layer uh, are making uh, a lot of connections. Each one of them is connecting a lot of Purkinje cells. Uh, and actually, uh, they are uh, perpendicular to the sagittal plane that you see here. These are the parallel fibers. And they are uh, making these connections in the uh, distal part of the dendritic tree. Uh, so uh, this was the experimental setup, a pressure chamber in which we uh, have, had a superfusing bath. This is the cerebellar slice. We can put manually uh, uh, tungsten uh, electrodes for pacing and a recording electrode, which we can, with a motor-driven uh, manipulator, uh, get the electrode to the right place. And actually, can, we could view the uh, molecular layer and the Purkinje cellar to locate it in the right place. And uh, the first thing I want to focus in is uh, the calcium spiking. We also worked on the sodium spiking, and I w I'm not going to get into the, that, this data, but uh, we actually could block sodium uh, spiking and get bursts of spontaneous calcium spiking. And these are mediated by, uh, or supposed to be mediated by PQ type uh, calcium channels. And as you can see, at high pressure, pressure had a very mild effect on these uh, calcium spikes. Some changes in rise time, in fall time, and so on, but basically the, the um, decrease of pressure was quite small. We were a little bit afraid that uh, there might be a, a mutual effect on, so on calcium uh, currents and on potassium currents, and therefore we see a net effect which is quite small. So, um, so in the, uh, we also use the potassium channel blocker for aminopyridine, and, and as you can see, it, uh, augments the obtained uh, calcium spike, but still it is rather resistant to high pressure. So uh, we conclude that these PQ type channels are probably quite resistant to the effect of pressure. Next thing was to look on the synaptic activity and we wanted to focus on the parallel fiber uh, response. And, and we struggled a lot with that since these parallel fibers are actually cut when you do a normal sagittal slice when you look on the sagittal slice, and we tried a lot, uh, we couldn't get a nice result uh, until we uh, uh, found out uh, from another paper that uh, this kind of uh, preparation, and we adapted it to our system with some uh, technique uh, for cutting, and we actually have B planar slice, which we put here in this bath, and then the parallel fibers are actually here. We put a stimulation electrode down there and a field recording here. And uh, this is the obtained result. Uh, you can see the input volley, the action potential, presynaptic action potential, gradually increasing with increased intensity. And following that, the FPSP, the postsynaptic potential, which is mediated by non-NMDA receptors and is completely blocked by CNQX. 
And if we plot it against the stimulus intensity, you can see a saturating curve for the input volley and for the FPSP. And if we plot them against each other, then we have actually uh, a slope which is showing us the, the synaptic strength. Uh, and this is uh, actually what we used in order to see the effect of pressure. Uh, so first thing, because we didn't know anything about this kind of preparation, we had to make sure that it is the, this uh, um, field recording is stable. And as you can see, for two hours, it is stable, so we can use it where it's much more than what we needed for the compression to high pressure. And this is actually what we got. You can see that the input valley itself is decreased a little bit, somewhat, uh, uh, but the postsynaptic, the FPSP, is reduced much further, and if this is the uh, summarize, summarizing the effective pressure on the input volley, on the postsynaptic response, and the slope uh, that we used, you, you can see actually that it's going down uh, at high pressure. So there is a depression of the synapse at high pressure. This is summarizing these results. You can see that the input volley, there are some changes, uh, some, I think, 30% decrease at uh, 10 megapascals. Uh, but the amplitude of the postsynaptic potential is reduced uh, almost 50 percent, and this was the main effect. Uh, we were we wanted to make sure that the reduction in the input volley is not actually triggering some of the effect on the postsynaptic potential. So we mimic this effect with the trodotoxin. As you can see here, it indeed reduced the input volley, but did not have much effect on the postsynaptic potential. And in fact, when you plot uh, the uh, FPSP against the input volley, the, we, in the presence of TTX, you get some increase in the slope and not decrease in the slope. Um, OK, the next thing we did was uh, based on some data that you already see, uh, you've already seen that suggests that anti-channels might be involved. We used an anti-channel blocker, omega conotoxin, and uh, you can see that this is the response under normal conditions, and when we add this blocker, we get reduced slope here. Uh, but afterwards, when we press, the remaining fraction remains uh, is rather resistant to pressure, uh, suggesting that this, uh, when you take away this fraction, the anti-fraction, you get a much resistant synapse. Uh, just to make sure, we also did some non-selective uh, reduction in calcium entry, like lowering the calcium, as, as you can see here, it does the same effect, but pressure still that, that does have an effect after non-selective reduction, and this is summarized here. This is the reduction in the slope under normal Ringer solution, and this is with non-selective reduced calcium entry, but when we use the anti-channel blocker, we had a much uh, resistant uh, synapse uh, at pressure. Uh, okay, the, the last thing that we worked on was to see what happens to facilitation as was done in the neuromuscular junction. As, and you can see here again that indeed there is depression of the postsynaptic potential, but the uh, PERT pass facilitation is increased at pressure, and this was seen in all interspike intervals that we checked. The presynaptic, the uh, uh, PERT pass facilitation was augmented. Uh, so it looks like the parallel fiber response is uh, rather similar in, in many properties to what uh, have been shown in the normal, in the uh, invertebrates uh, synapse. And then we uh, looked also on the climbing fiber response, which is uh, quite a different response. It's, as I said, it's a, a fo making a huge, uh, a lot of con uh, uh, contact with a single Purkinje neuron and it's supposed to work on a very high probability of release, and it's known from literature that when you do PERT stimulation, you get PERT pulse depression, and it's supposedly because of uh, synaptic depletion. Now what you see here is that when you increase pressure, we do get inhibition of the synapse as well uh, in the first response, but the PPD, the PERT pulse depression, is not affected much by pressure. Moreover, when we try to antagonize the effect of pressure with high calcium, as was shown in invertebrates, there is only partial recovery, and it's 
it's affecting the PPD, the per pulse depression. So it appears that calcium is not, is not affecting here the way we expected. And this is shown also here in this example in which we reduced the amount of calcium, extracellular calcium. And as you can see, as shown in the literature, this reduced the per pulse depression. However, after we got back to normal calcium, we pressurized this preparation and you can see that the PPD is unaffected. So this is a little bit surprising, and to summarize the results, we've shown uh, that dendritic calcium, PQ type uh, dependent calcium uh, spikes in Purkinje neurons are fairly resistant to the effect of pressure. Both the parallel fiber and the climbing fiber inputs are depressed at pressure, and uh, we can say that the um, effect of the parallel fiber response, the, the PPA, the perth pulse facilitation, which is mimicked, can be mimicked by low calcium, by voltage-dependent uh, uh, calcium channel blockers, which I, that, I did, uh, that I didn't show, uh, all these support the uh, involvement of pressure in the synaptic release mechanism, whereas the lack of pressure effect on the climbing fiber PPD me mechanism is rather surprising. And the results also indicate that, uh, again, that pressure effect may be selective for various types of synapses in the CNS. And as a final conclusion, I just want to mention my, that uh, this is my own new definition to HPNS. This is the hyperexcitability which occurs after a student is seeking for a good recording inside the pressure chamber for several hours and loses it in the first <laughs> minutes of compression. And I, I think only people who worked in this pressure chamber know to appreciate how difficult <laughs> these experiments are. And in this regard to that, I want to thank Rami for a wonderful adventure and for being a great mentor. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Rob. Uh, that last comment really, really gets to me. <clears throat> You're absolutely right. <laughs> Has anyone got a, any particular question? Yes. Uh, what a surprise. <laughs> Adolfo. Yes, sir. Uh, Joram, yes. how do you explain that you keep the um, parrot pole depression after you have reduced the amplitude of the first uh, uh, PSP, uh, EPSP? Well, this is, I think, the surprising part. I don't think we have a good explanation for that. I mean, uh, obviously, if there is something, uh, we, we can't exclude, I think, uh, completely uh, postsynaptic mechanism. These are also uh, an, a non-NMDA receptor, uh, I mean, uh, um, mediated uh, uh, responses. So uh, according to the literature, I think according to your literature, <laughs> we should not uh, expect any postsynaptic uh, effect. But uh, we don't have a good explanation. And if it's presynaptic, I think it's uh, rather surpri surprising. It might show that actually uh, you can re reduce the probability of release and still have per pulse depression uh, not affected. And I think this is uh, very, this might be very interesting. Uh, but we don't know the, the I, I must say that it's not, it's probably not inhibitory activity or something like that because all of these experiments were done uh, in the presence of bicuculin to block the GABAergic uh, interneuronal uh, effects there. Right. Okay, thank you very much, Ron.